Hi there. I'm going to be reading Chapter 9 of Lila, An Inquiry into Morals by Robert M. Persick. In any hierarchy of metaphysical classification, the most important division is the first one, for this division dominates everything beneath it. If this first division is bad, there's no way you can ever build a really good system of classification around it. In his book, Phaedrus tried to save quality from metaphysics by refusing to define it, by placing it outside the dialectical chessboard. Anything that is undefined is outside metaphysics, since metaphysics can only function with defined terms. If you can't define it, you can't argue about it. He had demonstrated that even though you can't define quality, you still must agree that it exists, since a world from which value is subtracted becomes unrecognizable. But he realized that sooner or later he was going to have to stop carping about how bad subject-object metaphysics was and say something positive for a change. Sooner or later, he was going to have to come up with a way of dividing quality that was better than subjects and objects. He would have to do that or get out of metaphysics entirely. It's all right to condemn someone else's bad metaphysics, but you can't replace it with a metaphysics that consists of just one word. By even using the term quality, it already violated the nothingness of mystic reality. The use of the term quality sets up a pile of questions of its own that have nothing to do with mystic reality and walks away leaving them unanswered. Even the name quality was a kind of definition since it tended to associate mystic reality with certain fixed and limited understandings. Already he was in trouble. Was the mystic reality of the universe really more imminent in the higher price cuts of meat in the butcher shop? These were quality meats, weren't they? Was the butcher using the term incorrectly? Feeders had no answers. That was the problem this morning, too, with Regal. Feeders had no answers. If you're going to talk about quality at all, you have to be ready to answer someone like Regal. You have to have a ready-made metaphysics of quality that you can snap at him like some catechism. Feeders didn't have a catechism of quality, and that's why he got hit. Actually, the issue before him was not whether there should be a metaphysics of quality or not. There already is a metaphysics of quality. A subject-object metaphysics is in fact a metaphysics in which the first division of quality, the first slice of undivided experience, is into subjects and objects. Once you've made that slice, all of human experience is supposed to fit into one of these two boxes. The trouble is it doesn't. What he had seen is that there is a metaphysical box that sits above these two boxes, quality itself. And once he had seen this, he also saw a large number of ways in which quality could be divided. Subjects and objects were just one of the ways. The question was, which way was best? Different metaphysical ways of dividing up reality have, over the centuries, tended to fan out into a structure that resembles a book on chess openings. If you say that the world is one, then somebody can ask, then why does it look like more than one? And if you answer that is due to faulty perception, he can ask, how do you know which perception is faulty and which is real? Then you have to answer that, and so on. Trying to create a perfect metaphysics is like trying to create a perfect chess strategy, one that will win every time. You can't do it. It's out of the range of human capability. No matter what position you take on a metaphysical question, someone will always start asking questions that will lead to more positions, that lead to more questions in this endless intellectual chess game. The game is supposed to stop when it is agreed that a particular line of reasoning is illogical. This is supposed to be similar to a checkmate, but conflicting positions go on for centuries without any such checkmate being agreed on. Peters had spent an enormous amount of time following what turned out to be lousy openings. A particularly large amount of this time had been spent trying to lay down the first line of division between the classic and romantic aspects of the universe he'd emphasized in his first book. In that book, his purpose had been to show how quality could unite the two, but in fact, that quality was the best way of uniting the two, was no guarantee that the reverse was true, that the classic romantic split was the best way of dividing quality. It wasn't. For example, American Indian mysticism is the same platypus in a world divided primarily into classic and romantic patterns under a subject-object division. When an American Indian goes into isolation and fasts in order to achieve a vision, the vision he seeks is not a romantic understanding of the surface beauty of the world. Neither is it a vision of the world's classic intellectual form. It is something else. Since the whole metaphysics had started with an attempt 
to explain Indian mysticism, Peters finally abandoned the classic romantic split as a choice for a primary division of the metaphysics of quality. The division he finally settled on was one he didn't really choose in any deliberative way. It was more as if it chose him. He'd been reading Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture without any particular search in mind when a relatively minor anecdote stopped him. It stayed with him for weeks. He couldn't get it out of his mind. The anecdote was a case history in which there was a conflict of morality. It concerned a Pueblo Indian who lived in Zuni, New Mexico in the 19th century. Like a Zen koan, which originally meant case history, the anecdote didn't have any single right answer, but rather a number of possible meanings that kept drawing Phaedrus deeper and deeper into the moral situation that was involved. Benedict wrote, most ethnologists have had experiences in recognizing that persons who are put outside the pale of society with contempt are not those who would be placed there by another culture. The dilemma of such an individual is often successfully solved by doing violence to his strongest natural impulses and accepting the role the culture honors. In case he is a person to whom social recognition is necessary, it is ordinarily his only possible course. She said that the person concerned was one of the most striking individuals in Zuni. Now we quote from the Benedict book. In a society that thoroughly distrusts authority of any sort, he had native personal magnetism that singled him out in any group. In a society that exalts moderation and the easiest way, he was turbulent and could act violently upon occasion. In a society that praises a pliant personality that talks lots, that is, that chatters in a friendly fashion, he was scornful and aloof. Zuni's only reaction to such personalities is to brand them as witches. He was said to have been peering through a window from outside, and this is a sure mark of a witch. At any rate, he got drunk one day and boasted that they could not kill him. He was taken before the war priests, who hung him up by his thumbs from the rafters till he should confess to his witchcraft. This is the usual procedure in a charge of witchcraft. However, he dispatched a messenger to the government troops. When they came, his shoulders were already crippled for life and the officer of the law was left with no recourse but to imprison the war priests who had been responsible for the enormity. One of these war priests was probably the most respected and important in recent Zuni history, and when he returned after imprisonment in the state penitentiary, he never resumed his priestly offices. He regarded his power as broken. It was a revenge that is probably unique in Zuni history. It involved, of course, a challenge to the priesthoods against whom the witch by his act, openly aligned himself. The course of his life in the 40 years that followed this defiance was not, however, what we might easily predict. A witch is not barred from his membership in cult groups because he has been condemned, and the way to recognition lay through such activity. He possessed a remarkable verbal memory and a sweet singing voice. He learned unbelievable stores of mythology, of esoteric ritual, of cult songs, Many hundreds of pages of stories and ritual poetry were taken down from his dictation before he died, and he regarded his songs as much more extensive. He became indispensable in ceremonial life, and before he died was the governor of Zuni. The congenital bent of his personality threw him into irreconcilable conflict with his society, and he solved his dilemma by turning an incidental talent to account. As we might well expect, he was not a happy man. As governor of Zuni and high in his cult groups, a marked man in his community, he was obsessed by death. He was a cheated man in the midst of a mildly happy populace. It is easy to imagine the life he might have lived among the Plains Indians, where every institution favored the traits that were native to him. The personal authority, the turbulence, the scorn would all have been honored in the career he could have made his own. The unhappiness that was inseparable from his temperament as a successful priest and governor of Zuni would have had no place as a war chief of the Cheyenne. It was not a function of the traits of his native endowment, but the standards of the culture in which he found no outlet for his native responses. When Phaedrus first read this passage, he felt a kind of eerie feeling, a feeling he might have had if he had passed in front of a strange mirror and suddenly seen a reflection of someone he'd never expect to see. It was the same feeling he got at the peyote meeting. This Zuni Indian was not exactly someone else. 
This was not just an isolated tribal incident going on here. This was something of a universal importance happening. This was every man. There is not a person alive who is not in some way or other in this kind of situation this witch was in. It was just that his circumstances were so exotic and so extreme, one could now see it by itself out in the open. The story was of a struggle between good and evil, but the quan it raised was which was which. Was this person really good, or was he perhaps also evil? At first reading, he might seem a model of goodness, a lone virtuous man surrounded by wicked persecutors. But this was too facile. Circumstances of the story argued against it. One of his tormentors was probably the most important and respected person in Zuni history. If his tormentor was so evil, why was he so respected? Was the whole Zuni culture evil? That was ridiculous. There was a lot more to it than that. Phaedrus saw that the question was thrown off by a connotation of witch. The word alone loaded the case against the priests, since everyone who calls someone else a witch is obviously a bigoted persecutor. But did they really call him a witch? A witch is a druid priestess, reduced by legend to an old crone who wears a pointed black hat and rides a broomstick in front of the moon on Halloween. Was that what they were calling him? In his qualm-like recycling of the event in his mind, Phaedrus came to think that Benedict had given the event an interpretation that didn't do it justice. She was finding stories to support her thesis that different cultures create different personality traits, which is important and undoubtedly true, but this man was more than just a misfit. There was something deeper than that going on. Misfit is one of those words that seem to explain things but does not. Misfit says only that something is not explained. If he was a misfit, why didn't he leave? What persuaded him to stay? It certainly wasn't timidity. And why did the citizens of Zuni change their minds and make this former witch their governor? There's no indication that he changed or they changed. She said he turned an incidental talent to account in order to satisfy his need for societal recognition. Probably so, but Zuni or no Zuni, it takes stronger social forces than a good singing voice and a need for social recognition to turn a misfit and torture victim into a governor. How did he do it? What were his powers? Was there something special in the way Pueblo Indians think that after 10,000 years of continuous culture, they would let a drunkard and a window peeper get away with this? Phaedrus did not think so. He thought a better name for him might have been sorcerer or shaman or brujo, a Spanish term used extensively in that region that denotes a quite different kind of person. A brujo is not a semi-mythical, semi-comic figure that rides a broomstick, but a real person who claims religious powers, who acts outside of and sometimes against the local church authorities. This was not the case of priests persecuting an innocent person. This was a much deeper conflict between a priesthood and a shaman. A passage from the anthropologist E. A. Hobel confirmed Peters's idea. Although in many primitive cultures there is a recognized division of function between priests and shamans, in the more highly developed cultures in which cults have become strongly organized churches, the priesthood fights an unrelenting war against shamans. Priests work in a rigorously structured hierarchy fixed in a firm set of traditions. Their power comes from and is invested in the organization itself. They constitute a religious bureaucracy. Shamans, on the other hand, are errant individuals. Each is on his own, undisciplined by bureaucratic control, hence a shaman is always a threat to the order of the organized church. In the view of the priests, they are presumptive pretenders. Joan of Arc was a shaman, for she communed directly with the angels of God. She steadfastly refused to recant and admit delusion, and her martyrdom was ordained by the functionaries of the church. The struggle between shaman and priest may well be a death struggle. For weeks, Phaedrus returned to these questions before he saw that the key lay in the war priest's statement that his powers had been broken. Something very grave had occurred. The priest refused to return to a priestly office after return from the penitentiary. What had occurred had been enormous. Phaedrus concluded that a huge battle had taken place for the entire mind and soul of Zuni. The priests had proclaimed themselves good and the brujo evil. The brujo had proclaimed himself good and the priests evil. A showdown had occurred, and a brujo had won. Phaedrus began to suspect that Benedict missed all this because she was trained by the objectivity of science by Boas. 
She tried to show only those aspects of Zuni culture that were independent of the white observer. This explains why the Brujo analyzed only in terms of relations within his own culture, although by her own accounting he was very much in contact with the whites. It was the white man to whom he sent for help and who saved him. It was the white anthropologist, presumably, who took dictation of all his songs and stories and made him well known in books of which his tribesmen could not have been ignorant. Fiedrich concluded that the real reason the people of Zuni made the Brujo governor had to be because of this. The Brujo had shown he could easily deal successfully with the one tribe that could easily wipe them out any time it wanted to. It wasn't just a sweet singing voice that made him governor of Zuni. He had real political clout. Sometimes you can see your own society's issues more clearly when they are put in an exotic context like that of the Brujo in Zuni. That is a huge reward from the study of anthropology. As Friedrich thought about this context again and again, it became apparent that there were two kinds of good and evil involved. The tribal frame of values that condemned the Brujo and led to his punishment was one kind of good, for which Friedrich coined the term static good. Each culture has its own pattern of static good derived from fixed laws and traditions and values that underlie them. This pattern of static good is the essential structure of the culture itself and defines it. In the static sense, the brujo is very clearly evil to oppose the appointed authorities of his tribe. Suppose everyone did that. The whole Zuni culture, after thousands of years of continuous survival, would collapse into chaos. But in addition, there's a dynamic good that is outside the system of any culture that cannot be contained by any system of precepts, but has to be continually rediscovered as a culture evolves. Good and evil are not entirely a matter of tribal custom. If they were, no tribal change would be possible, since custom cannot change custom. There has to be another source of good and evil outside the tribal customs that produce the tribal change. If you had asked the Brujo what ethical principles he was following, he probably wouldn't have been able to tell you. He wouldn't have understood what you were talking about. He was just following some vague sense of betterness that he couldn't have defined if he had wanted to. Probably the war priest thought he was some kind of egotist, trying to build his own image by tearing down tribal authority. But he showed later on that he really wasn't. If he had been such an egotist, he wouldn't have stayed with the tribe and helped keep it together. The Brujo's values were in conflict with the tribe, at least, partly because he had learned to value some of the ways of the new neighbors that they had not. He was a precursor of deep cultural change. A tribe can change its values only person by person, and someone has to be first. Whoever is first obviously is going to be in conflict with everybody else. He didn't have to change his ways to conform to the culture only because the culture was changing its ways to conform to him. And that is what made him seem like such a leader. Probably he wasn't telling anyone to do this or to do that so much as he was just being himself. He may never have seen his struggle as anything but a personal one. But because the culture was in transition, many people saw this Brujo's ways to be of higher quality than those of the old priests and tried to become more like him. In this dynamic sense, the Brujo was good because he saw the new source of good and evil before the other members of his tribe did. Undoubtedly, he did much during his life to prevent a clash of cultures that would have been completely destructive to the people of Zuni. Whatever the personality traits were that made him such a rebel from the tribe around him, this man was no misfit. He was an integral part of the Zuni culture. The whole tribe was in a state of evolution that had emerged many centuries ago from cliff-dwelling isolation. Now it was entering a state of cooperation with the whites and submission to white laws. He was an active catalytic agent in that tribe's social evolution, and his personal conflicts were a part of the tribe's cultural growth. Fiedrich thought that the story of the old Pueblo Indian, seen in this way, made deep and broad sense and justified the enormous feeling of drama that it produced. After many months of thinking about it, he was left with a reward of two terms dynamic good and static good, which became the basic division of his emerging metaphysics of quality. It certainly felt right, not subject and object, but static and dynamic is the basic division of reality. When A. N. Whitehead wrote that mankind is driven forward by dim apprehensions of things too obscure for its existing language, he was writing about dynamic quality. Dynamic quality is the pre-intellectual cutting edge of reality, the source of all things, completely simple and always new. 
It was the moral force that had motivated the brujo in Zuni. It contains no pattern of fixed rewards and punishments. Its only perceived good is freedom, and its only perceived evil is static quality itself. Any pattern of one-sided fixed values that tries to contain and kill the ongoing free force of life. Static quality, the moral force of the priest, emerges in the wake of dynamic quality. It is old and complex. It always contains a component of memory. Good is conformity to an established pattern of fixed values and value objects. Justice and law are identical. Static morality is full of heroes and villains, loves and hatreds, carrots and sticks. Its values don't change by themselves unless they are altered by dynamic quality. They say the same thing year after year. Sometimes they say it more loudly, sometimes more softly, but the message is always the same. During the next few months that Phaedrus reflected, he began to transpose the static dynamic division out of the moral conflict of the Zuni into other seemingly unrelated areas. The negative aesthetic quality of the hot stove in the earlier example was now given some added meaning by a static dynamic division of quality. When the person who sits on the stove first discovers his low quality situation, the front edge of his experience is dynamic. He does not think, this stove is hot, and then make a rational decision to get off. A dim perception of what he knows not what gets him off, dynamically. Later, he generates static patterns of thought to explain the situation. A subject-object metaphysics presumes that this kind of dynamic action, without thought, is rare and ignores it when possible. But mystic learning goes into the opposite direction and tries to hold to the ongoing dynamic edge of all experience, both positive and negative, even the dynamic ongoing edge of thought itself. Phaedrus thought that of the two kinds of students, those who study only subject-object science and those who study only meditative mysticism, it would be the mystic students who would get off the stove first. The purpose of mystic meditation is not to remove oneself from experience, but to bring oneself closer to it by eliminating stale, confusing, static intellectual attachments of the past. In a subject-object metaphysics, morals and art are worlds apart, morals being concerned with the subject quality and art with object quality. But in the metaphysics of quality, that division doesn't exist. They're the same. They both become much more intelligible when references to what is subjective and what is objective are completely thrown away and references to what is static and what is dynamic are taken up instead. He found an example within the field of music. He said, imagine that you walk down a street past, say, a car where someone has the radio on and plays a tune you've never heard before, but which is so fantastically good, it just stops you in your tracks. You listen until it's done. Days later, you remember exactly what the street looked like when you heard that music. You remember what was in the store window you stood in front of. You remember what the colors of cars in the street were where the clouds were in the sky above the buildings across the street, and it all comes back so vividly, you wonder what song they were playing, so you wait until you hear it again. If it's that good, you'll hear it again because other people will have heard it too, and have that same feeling, and it will make it popular. One day it comes on the radio again, and you get the same feeling again, and you catch the name, and you rush down the street to the record store and buy it, and can hardly wait until you get home and play it. You get home, you play it, it's really good. It doesn't quite transform the whole room into something different, but it's really good. You play it again, really good. You play it another time, still good, but you're not so sure you want to play it again. But you play it again. It's okay, but now you definitely don't want to play it again. You put it away. The next day you play it again, and it's okay, but something is gone. You still like it, and always will, you say. You play it again, yeah, that's sure a good record, but you file it away. And once in a while you play it again for a friend, and maybe months or years later you bring it out as a memory of something you were once crazy about. Now what has happened? You can say you've gotten tired of the song, but what does that mean? Has the song lost its quality? If it has, why do you still say it's a good record? Either it's good or it's not good. If it's good, why don't you play it? If it's not good, why do you tell your friend it's good? If you think about this question long enough, you will come to see that the same kind of division between dynamic quality and static quality that exists in the field of morals also exists in the field of art. The first good that made you want to buy the record was dynamic quality. Dynamic quality comes as a sort of surprise.
what the record did was weaken for a moment your existing static patterns in such a way that the dynamic quality all around you shone through. It was free, without static forms. The second good, the kind that made you want to recommend it to a friend, even when you had lost your own enthusiasm for it, is static quality. Static quality is what you normally expect. Soon after that, Fetus ran across another example that concerned neither art nor morality, but referred indirectly to mystic reality itself. It was an essay by Walker Percy called The Delta Factor. It asks, why is a man apt to feel bad in a good environment, say suburban Short Hills, New Jersey, on an ordinary Wednesday afternoon? Why is the same man apt to feel good in a very bad environment, say an old hotel in Key Largo in a hurricane? Why is it that a man riding a good commuter train from Larchmont to New York, whose needs and drives are satisfied, who has a good home, loving wife and family, good job, and enjoys unprecedented culture and recreational facilities, often feels bad without knowing why. Why is it that, if such a man suffers a heart attack and, taken off the train in New Rochelle, regains consciousness and finds himself in a strange place, then he comes to himself for the first time in years, perhaps in his life, and begins to gaze at his own hand with a sense of wonder and delight? These are haunting questions, but with quality divided into dynamic and static components, a way of approaching them emerges. A home in suburban Short Hills, New Jersey, on an ordinary Wednesday afternoon, is filled with static patterns. A hurricane in Key Largo promises a dynamic relief from static patterns. The man who suffers a heart attack and is taken off the train at New Rochelle has had all his static patterns shattered and he can't find them, and in that moment only dynamic quality is available to him. That is why he gazes at his own hand with a sense of wonder and delight. Fedra saw that not only a man recovering from a heart attack, but also a baby gazes at his hand with a mystic wonder and delight. He remembered the child Poincaré referred to who could not understand the reality of objective science at all, but was able to understand the reality of value perfectly. When this reality of value is divided into static and dynamic areas, a lot can be explained about that baby's growth that is not well explained otherwise. One can imagine how an infant in the womb acquires awareness of simple distinctions such as pressure and sound, and then at birth acquires more complex ones of light and warmth and hunger. We know these distinctions of pressure and sound and light and warmth and hunger and so on, but the baby doesn't. We could call that stimuli, but the baby doesn't identify them as that. From the baby's point of view, something, he knows not what, compels attention. This generalized something, Whitehead's dim apprehension, is dynamic quality. When he is a few months old, the baby studies his hand or rattle, not knowing it is a hand or a rattle, with the same sense of wonder and mystery and excitement created by the music and heart attack in the previous examples. If the baby ignores this force of dynamic quality, it can be speculated that he will become mentally retarded. But if he is normally attentive to dynamic quality, he will soon begin to notice differences and then correlations between the differences and then repetitive patterns of the correlations. But it is not until the baby is several months old that he will begin to really understand enough about that enormously complex correlation of sensations and boundaries and desires called an object to be able to reach for one. This object will not be a primary experience. It will be a complex pattern of static values derived from primary experience. Once the baby has made a complex pattern of values called an object and found this pattern to work well, he quickly develops a skill and speed at jumping through the chain of deductions that produced it as though it were a single jump. This is similar to the way one drives a car. The first time there is a very slow trial and error process of seeing what causes what. But in a very short time, it becomes so swift one doesn't even think about it. The same is true of objects. One uses these complex patterns in the same way one shifts a car, without thinking about them. Only when the shift doesn't work, or an object turns out to be an illusion, is one forced to become aware of the deductive process. That is why we think of subjects and objects as primary. We can't remember that period of our lives when they were anything else. In this way, static patterns of value become the universe of indistinguishable things. Elementary static distinctions between such entities as before and after, and between like and unlike, 
grow into enormously complex patterns of knowledge that are transmitted from generation to generation as the mythos, the culture in which we live. This, Fiedrich thought, was why little children are usually quicker to perceive dynamic quality than old people, why beginners are usually quicker than experts, why primitive people are sometimes quicker than those of advanced cultures. American Indians are exceptionally skilled at holding to the ever-changing center of things. That is the real reason they speak and act without ornamentation. It violates their mystic unity. This moving and acting and talking in accord with the great spirit and almost nothing else has been the ancient center of their lives. Their term, Manito, is often used interchangeably with God by whites, who usually think all religion is theistic and by Indians themselves, who don't make a big deal out of any verbal distinctions. But as David Mandelbaum noted in his book, The Plains Cree, the term Manito primarily referred to the supreme being, but also had many other usages. It was applied to manifestations of skill, fortune, blessing, luck, to any wondrous occurrence. It connoted any phenomenon that transcended the run of everyday experience, in other words, dynamic quality. With the identification of static and dynamic quality as the fundamental division of the world, Fiedrich felt that some kind of goal had been reached. The first division of the metaphysics of quality now covered the spectrum of experience from primitive mysticism to quantum mechanics. What remained for Peters to do next was to fill in the gaps as carefully and methodically as he could. In the past, Peters' own radical bias caused him to think of dynamic quality alone and neglect static patterns of quality. Until now, he had always felt that these static patterns were dead. They have no love. They offer no promise of anything. To succumb to them is to succumb to death, since that which does not change cannot live. But now he was beginning to see that this radical bias weakened his own case. Life can't exist on dynamic quality alone. It has no staying power. To cling to dynamic quality alone, apart from any static patterns, is to cling to chaos. He saw that much can be learned about dynamic quality by studying what it is not, rather than futilely trying to define what it is. Static quality patterns are dead when they are exclusive, when they demand blind obedience and suppress dynamic change. But static patterns, nevertheless, provide a necessary stabilizing force to protect dynamic progress from degeneration. Although dynamic quality and quality of freedom creates this world in which we live, these patterns of static quality, the quality of order, preserve our world. Neither static nor dynamic quality can survive without the other. If one inserts this concept into a case such as that of the Brujo in Zuni, one can see the truth of it. Although the dynamic Brujo and the static priests who tortured him appeared to be mortal enemies, they were actually necessary to each other. Both types of people had to exist. If most of Zuni went around drunk and bragging and looking in windows, that ancient way of life could never have lasted. But without the wild, disreputable outcasts like the Brujo, ready to seize on any new outside idea and bring it into the community, Zuni would have been too inflexible to survive. A tension between these two forces is needed to continue the evolution of life. The beauty of that old Indian, Feeders thought, is that he seemed to have understood this. He wasn't interested in just knocking things down and walking off into the sunset with some kind of moral victory. The old priestly ways would have come back and all his suffering would have been wasted. He didn't do that. He stayed around the rest of his life, became part of the static pattern of the tribe, and lived to see his reforms become a part of the tribe's ongoing culture. Slowly at first, and then with increasing awareness that he was going in the right direction, Fiedrus' central attention turned away from any further explanation of dynamic quality and turned toward the static patterns themselves.